Uh, Frank Saravalli joins us now. We're very, very excited to have him on the show. Uh, Frank, thanks so much for joining us. What the hell can you tell us about the Arizona Coyotes? Oh, man, what a day. Uh, look, here's the best way I can frame it. Um, the Arizona Coyotes and Ryan Smith of the Smith Entertainment Group in Salt Lake City are well down the track on an agreement with the NHL, which would see the franchise be sold and relocated to Salt Lake City in time for next season's play. Um, this has been in the works for a couple weeks. I've mentioned a bunch of this in my reporting, much to the chagrin of Coyotes fans who kept calling me a hater, and that's fine. Um, I actually feel bad for them and the spot that they're in as fans. Um, but nonetheless, um, not done, but certainly well on the path. If this, if the Coyotes do end up in Salt Lake City with a new owner, uh, a more st stable future, what could that mean even from an on-ice perspective, a roster building perspective, just because Arizona for so many years now has been just hoarding a million draft picks, taking on a bunch of dead contracts, and feels like they've been unable to get out of that rebuilding phase. Is, th is this good news for them from an on-ice team-building perspective? To be fair, Harm, I, I think that the on-ice portion of what the Coyotes have been working on hasn't really been touched, so to speak. Like I think that they've sort of been able to operate and do a pretty nice job, all things considered. Um, player, I'd say player recruitment-wise. I mean, think about how hard it might have been if you're Bill Armstrong, the GM, to recruit free agents. Think about how difficult it might have been to engage with future lottery picks the coyotes picked at six and 12 last year they ended up selecting two russians um because there might have been some players that were like hey that's the last place i want to go with their uncertain future so i i think they've they've got some real nice foundational pieces um logan cooley certainly you know jumps to the top of my mind when i think about that and and clayton keller and and Lawson Krause and, and the guys that they do have, I'd include Sean Dersey in that category too. Um, and then the prospects, the draft picks that you mentioned, like if I'm Ryan Smith in Salt Lake City, I am over the moon excited to have this as my starting point as opposed to starting from absolute scratch with an expansion franchise. Um, this is way better to deal with i think it's way quicker on the ascent you have potentially a place with some excitement and could provide some energy and shot in the arm in the around the league that hey like this could be a real destination place that players want to play and so in the meantime it's about kind of doing it the right way and putting all the pieces together in the proper order but i think with some stability there it could drastically change the fortunes on ice success wise of this franchise moving forward. That's a really interesting way to look at it because you think about from an operating perspective, low payroll, like you're not going to have crazy operating costs and you could have some on ice success, which would obviously uh, bring you a lot of revenue. So yeah, definitely a very uh, interesting situation to follow. Is there anything else? We well, I was going to say, I don't think this? that that operating cost would be an issue for Ryan Smith. Like this guy is a legit billionaire that already owns an NBA team. Like he understands how to operate a pro sports franchise isn't going into this blind. So um, I'd envision, you know, without having talked to Ryan Smith or knowing his game plan, why wouldn't they want to jump to be closer yeah. to being a cap, you know, cap spending team? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just so many. You're gonna have so many impact players on such low dollar values that you you could you could turn this around really quickly. Anything else we should know about this, Frank? Before we move topics, I would say, uh, look, not done, but certainly um, trending in that direction. I, you know, we can quibble over what that means. Is there a verbal agreement in place? Are they close to one? Here's what I know: is that there are no signatures. There's no paper. Uh, they want to try and get that done as soon as possible. A lot of people seem to think that a uh, April 18th is the day. Um, I, I mentioned that in the story this morning. And so we'll see. But I, I, I'd say if you were to ask me what percentage chance I think the Coyotes will be playing in Salt Lake City next year, my answer would be like 90 to 95. Hmm. 
That's a hot, that's a high number. Okay, people are calling us cowards in the chat for not uh, already asking you about it, but you made some headlines last week in Vancouver, Frank, uh, when you said it's a close, close race between Kale McCarr and Quinn Hughes for the Norris. We spent all of last week talking about how it shouldn't be close from a statistical perspective, but I found your take interesting because it does give you that sense, that broader kind of sense of around the league, not just Vancouver. There's a lot of voters around the league. Uh, how do you look at the Norris debate right now? Well, it's really interesting to listen. And I'm not saying anyone's wrong, by the way. I'm just, it's interesting to listen to the sicko fans that I would say are part of who are commenting here because I had some guy tweeting at me saying, if Quinn Hughes isn't your Norris trophy vote, then you shouldn't get a vote. And I'm just thinking to myself, that's not really how voting works. <laughs> like, if we all thought the same and believed the same, what would be the incentive or point to vote? And so I would say outside of the bubble of your market, and I think there's a ton of great points to make. And, and I would say having spent a lot of time this past weekend after making those comments, studying some of the metrics and numbers, um, I would say I'm leaning to toward Quinn Hughes. But to say that it's like, this isn't a debate. Why are we even talking about this? Can't believe that you know, there, there's only one candidate here. Like that's not how people are viewing it outside of your bubble. So, um, what ends up happening? I, I have no idea. Again, that's why we vote, but I don't, I don't view it kind of quite clearly and cut as dry, cut and dry as everyone else might. Yeah. Frank, the, the way I kind of look at it is offensively, obviously Hughes and McCarr, the difference between them is probably going to be neg negligible, right? They're going to finish with basically identical uh, point totals. But where I think Hughes may separate himself from Makar this year uh, is, A, he's been substantially better defensively by sort of every measure, whether it's goals against, shots against, chances against. And so you look at that defensive zone impact, um, I think there's a sig significant edge there. And then the second point that, uh, that I think um, voters should consider is that Makar's results are likely propped up to some extent by... Um, Nathan McKinnon, it's interesting that almost 70% of Makar's five on five ice time has, um, has been alongside McKinnon, who's probably at this point, the front runner to win the heart trophy. And here's a catch. I, I don't know if many people know this Makar's results this year actually fall off a cliff away from McKinnon. So you look at when Makar is away from McKinnon at five on five this season, the abs have actually been outscored 21 to 14, right? Whereas Quinn, on the other hand, A, he doesn't have a, a forward of McKinnon's caliber to play with. Uh, and then B, his numbers are consistently elite, regardless of whether he's played with Vancouver's first line, second line, third line, fourth line. So I think that's where, in terms of defensive and all-around impact, uh, Hughes, I think, has a decisive edge. But I can see why, for a lot of other people outside, outside of the market, that it is close, even though, um, yeah, I, I, I think it should be Hughes. So all fair points. Um, I did know that McCarr's numbers were not as good with McKinnon. I would say in response to that, that I don't know that McKinnon is as much of a slam dunk again, as a lot of people are saying with the heart. This is another good example because you, if you scroll through social media, watching McKinnon get the hat trick last night, people are like, look at this guy bullying his way through the rest of the league. Absolutely deserves it. I think people are so kind of drunk on the style in a good way that McKinnon has that it's trumping or um, it's more visible. It's right in front of your face than what Nikita Kucherov is doing, for instance, mm. in Tampa. He's 53 points of his next clear of his next closest teammate. He continues night after night to do something special. His numbers this season against top 10 opponents in the league, he's averaging north of two points per game. The other guys have feasted more on teams toward the bottom of the standings. Does that matter? I don't know. Um, Nathan McKinnon and Connor McDavid, they both have 100-point teammates that they play frequently with. Like, There's a million factors, and that's just the hard part of it. Now, without me stepping onto a landmine and having an honest sort of, hey, I haven't done any prep on this, Parm, <laughs> give me the details on how Quinn Hughes has fared with and without Philip Aronik they haven't really spent much time apart this year uh i can quickly look it up i can find that we did that at canucks army 
the answer ended up being all I remember is that Heronic got substantially worse, and you put Quinn Hughes with like Noah Juleson, and it was the same results. And okay, and see, that's an another that that would be another important data point to me as I consider this moving forward. Because here's one of the other things that I've been wrestling with, and we've had this conversation when it came to Heronic and the contract talk that. I don't, I'm not bringing it back to him, but I, I think what you try and do when you're sizing up someone's season is also sort of isolate some of the other factors if you can. Quinn Hughes has taken an enormous step forward this season, you know, compared to some others in his career. What has been some of the different factors comparing this year to last? What do you think would be the biggest reason why? Quinn Hughes has had so much more success. I'm asking an open-ended question this year than last year or the year prior. It, it has been that he's had a chance to, to play with Philip Ronick, whereas in the past he hasn't had, you know, outside of his rookie year with Tanev, a legit top four caliber partner. And I think in relation to the Norris conversation, um, the counter argument would be, well, Kale McCarr gets to play with Devon Taves, who I think most would take Taves over Heronic um, as, a, as a defenseman. I just want to be clear. Like, I'm not taking anything away from Hughes when I ask that question. I'm just saying in general, I'd love to try and figure out why he was able to take such part of it's going to be on him. Part of it's just going to be environment too, right? And that goes for any player that has that jump. Like I said, I'm leaning towards Quinn Hughes. Um, I just don't think it's like, Quinn Hughes here and then Kale McCarr 24% behind. That's not how I view it. I don't know that anyone reasonably outside of Vancouver is looking at it in a different way. I also think it has a lot to do with um, the coaching. Like I think they've had a much better defensive system this year, which has helped Quinn Hughes a lot. Um, and that's why I think you still see those results, even if he's not with Philip Peronic. Um, and I don't know why I can't figure it out, but I was on, I was on, um, what's that site? Not natural yes, staff. Patrick. I'm trying to figure out how to do the with and without thing. I don't, I haven't done it in a while. I can't remember how to get it. I also think um, to, to further uh, sort of answer your, your question about what's perhaps changed this, this season. I think it is interesting. Like, I wonder if part of it isn't so much. Yeah. Like Quinn Hughes has definitely leveled up this year, but he was also spectacular last year. I would argue borderline top five defenseman last season. But because the Canucks were so brutal, he didn't have that narrative going for him, right? Like it didn't hard have the to... point total either in the production. It was good, yeah. but it wasn't this. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's a good point. He even brought it up last year. Like he was asked about the Norris, and he just he didn't he didn't really want to talk about it. He just said like I think you have to be on a winning team to win those awards. Like that was yeah, his and answer. I, and I think that's a big reason it. why like the narrative is much stronger this year. Is he's now captaining a winning team, whereas in years past the Canucks have in a dumpster fire all fair points um but i think this is why it's fun it is fun i can't find this i'm sorry guys i was really trying to find the exact numbers Harry, can you just find it on natural okay. yeah. you know Dude, it's so site. wild to me though like how in in a way i love the like passion but it, on another yeah. hand i'm like slightly alarmed by the vitriol that's like <laughs> look at this guy he's an absolute canuck hater and it's like dude i i don't i i promise you i don't care here's um, the thing frank i want to try and yeah. fill out the best most informed ballot i can which is yeah. why i don't i also don't generally give out my picks before cuz i want the reserve the right to change them as i get closer to you know ballots are going out yeah. on friday uh, both of you gentlemen will re be receiving one and we've got a, you know, another week beyond that to figure it out. We've got nine days and I intend to use eight and a half of them to get there. So I quickly looked it up. Uh, Hughes's numbers, uh, five on five in about 325 minutes, uh, away from Heronic are actually slightly better. Um, outscored opponents 17 to seven at five on five and uh, controlling 61% of scoring chances. So uh, Hughes' numbers have been elite with Heronic and without him. I, that's why I prefaced my question without stepping on a landmine. I wasn't asking it in a way that shaded the answer. It was a legitimate, hey, that's another important data point that is a nice check mark in Quinn Hughes' column. 
I'm gonna give you uh, another answer to one of your questions. And Frank, I know I know you gotta go, but the the reason that there's the vitriol in defense of Canucks fans, and I know people say some pretty awful things, so I'm not defending those people, but the reason Canucks fans are so riled up about this, part of the reason, they saw Daniel Sedin get robbed of the MVP, the heart heart uh, heart trophy in 2010-11, losing it to Corey Perry, who had less points, arguably less impact on his team. He had 50 goals, of course. I, again, I think that was cited as, oh, well, he's got more goals. It's, he's got to win the heart. Uh, I, I, I would argue that Daniel Sedin definitely deserved to win the heart trophy in 2010-11. Look, I'm just trying to be a lieutenant in the Canuck <laughs> Army, so whatever that requires... <laughs> We appreciate your time, Frank. And, and we're looking forward to this uh, Arizona report, kind of what comes of it next. Great reporting again, Frank. We really appreciate you taking the time and we appreciate you uh, entertaining us on this Norris Trophy conversation. See you guys. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.